walk away from me. Then I see you walk away, see you walk away from me. Hello and welcome to the Queen of Nations show. I'm your host, Lady M, a.k.a. Sharil Guy, a.k.a. Manek Numi Smith. I'm in the Queen with my lovely host, Queen C in the building. Lovely Mo. Mm, and we would like to thank you for entering the Queendom. Right. Yes, and in the Queendom, we educate, enlighten, and entertain you. Mm-hmm. In the Queendom, we also will be your direct source of information, news, fun, entertainment. We the Queens, Queen C. Lady M. And Love Limo. We'll bring you essence, beauty, black culture, issues related to views of society, y'all. <laughs> Rhythm and soul. I don't think you like that word too I good. I don't. You slip up every time. Oh. She don't like that word too good. She don't keep on slipping up. We're going to call her out on it. Oh, <laughs> Make the soul do it. What do you think? <laughs> but... When we left in December, guys, we left you um, on our Christmas segment. We were dressed in pajamas. It was fun. We left dancing off the set. It was so great. Um, we had Jill Tindall of Tindall Touch in the uh, studio with us. She gave us some great tidbits. We talked about crystals and healing and what her company does as far as natural creams and natural beauty products. It was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. The new year has came in since we were last here. Um, Queen C has made some great accomplishments. So what have you done, Queen? Oh, wow. Uh, like I said, God has been good to me. Um, I have just been excelling in school. I'm in school for cosmetology. Yes. And, Lord, I just can't be nothing but more excited about it. Mm -hmm. I graduate in May. Yes. So, class of 2020. Queen of snap. <laughs> Queen of snap. And I just got so many other dreams and goals that I'm trying to accomplish. So, mm -hmm. I'm not stopping with the cosmetology degree. I'm taking it a little further. And I'm mm -hmm. going with that cosmetology instructor to, mm. degree. So, like wow. I said... 2020 is just all gas, no mm -hmm. brakes, girl. And that's going to be great for you because you used to yes. do those tutorials. Believe it or not, she would get up in the morning and she would do these tutorials. And I learned how to do quite a few of my <laughs> hairstyles from watching your tutorials. So you're going to be a great instructor. Well, Congratulations. Thank you. She need a queen thank of snap. You. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I agree. So, lovely Mo, New Year's. What's been going on? Well, doing good in school. I graduate in May of 2020. Queen of snap. Yeah. Two girls graduating. <laughs> yeah. I'm going off to school to Xavier University of Louisiana, mm -hmm. and I'm just excited to be leaving soon. I know that's right. She's ready to go off and be on her own and experience some new things. Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing like Ain't beauty nothing brains, like black nothing beauty like brains, it. is Nothing it? like nothing it. Nothing like it. And we're going to have a graduation party on the show for <laughs> Look, both of them. to do that. I think we need to do that in the Queen. I'm what y'all think. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm full. So, I agree. I think it's going to be great. But with that being said, this is February. We are in Black History Month. So with that being said, we are going to discuss all the pioneers that, well, some pioneers that have paved the way for African Americans like ourselves. Um, and Black History Month, if, if you don't know, it began in 1915. It was a half a century after the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States. Um, it is an annual celebration of achievements of African Americans, and it is a time for recognizing the central role of blacks in United States history. Um, the event started as what we call Negro History Week, and it was started by the brainchild of the historian Carter G. Woodson, for those of you that don't know that, and also it was incorporated by other prominent African Americans. So with that being said, every president since 1976, and I was born in 76, <laughs> has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. Wow. Canada, the United Kingdom, and Ireland also celebrates Black History Month, for those of you that didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, and so before we go any further within the Queendom, um, we would like to pay our respects for Black History Month to Kobe Bryant, to his daughter, D Gigi, to Peyton Chester, to Sarah Chester, to Alyssa Altabelli, to Carrie Altabelli, to John Altabelli, to Christina Mauser, and to Ava Zabayan. That is everybody that has lost their lives on that plane. So we're going to go to commercial and we'll be back to talk a little bit more about black history with you guys. With the 13th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Charlotte Hornets select Kobe Bryant from Lower Marion High School in Pennsylvania. 
It's been a long day without you, my friend. And I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. We've come a long way from where we began. Oh, I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. When I see. Welcome back to the Queen of Nation. I'm your host, Lady M, with my co-host, Queen C. And Ms. Lovely Mo. And we are in our segment of Black History. So we're going to get Queen C to kind of tell you a little bit about Lift Every Voice and Sing and what that means. Wow. Yes. This this is something right here. Yes, because we grew up with that. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, the Lift Every Voice and Sing, uh, while being acknowledged as a Negro National Anthem, mm -hmm. a Negro National Anthem, it girl. Is. Yes, Yes, it is. It is. was written at a pivotal time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Crow was replacing slavery and African Americans were searching for an identity. Yes. Mm -mm -mm. Arthur and activist James Weldon Johnson wrote the words as a poem, mm -hmm. and his brother John then set it to music. Right. Okay. Yes. The song was named the Negro Spiritual Anthem due to two key events in 1905. Right. Booker T. Washington endorsed it, and in 1919, it became the official song of the NAACP. Wow. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that didn't know that tidbit information about Lift Every Voice and Sing, there's a little bit of information for you to understand why we actually sing that song in Black History Month. Lovely Mo, what you got for us? Lift Every Voice and Sing spoke to the history of the dark journey of African Americans. The song became a rally cry for black communities, especially in the South. Its influence reached beyond those boundaries. It acknowledges the obstacles that African Americans face in their struggle for freedom while also taking sh stock of the very long way we come from in that struggle. Yes. People began singing it around the world in places such as Japan and South America. Wow. As the end of the civil rights movements moved towards the end, most popular songs like We Shall Overcome became more popular. Lift Every Voice and Sing was a representation that all Americans should be linked together by song. That was a great thing because I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. As much as I had researched about with every voice and saying, I did not know the meaning really behind that song. Mm -hmm. So researching that really gave me a new perspective mm -hmm. now of why we sing that song. Yes. And with that being said, so in honor of Black History Month, we have invited a very special guest into the kingdom today. It is Salisbury's own Pastor Anthony Smith. So mm -hmm. let's give him a queen of snap, ladies. <laughs> um, Pastor Anthony Smith is a um, pastor of the Mission House Church. He is a poet, he is an abolitionist, he is an activist, and he is a mystic. So welcome to the Queendom Nation, Pastor Smith. Amen. Glad to be here. Mm -hmm. Honored to be here. We are so honored to have In the Queendom. Yes. yes, right. Yes. <laughs> yes. So honored to have you. Amen. Um, we're just going to go right into it. Sure. Um, and go ahead. And But first of all, before we get into what you do and mm -hmm. what you bring to the city of Salisbury, tell me about Anthony Smith, just as an individual, as a man. Uh, so, uh, married to my wife, Tony. Uh, we're partners in ministry. Uh, we're married, we'll be married for 10 years uh, next month. All right. Um, we have six children. Mm -hmm. We have three granddaughters. Mm -hmm. And another granddaughter is expected any day now. Oh, oh exciting. Exciting. Yeah. exciting. So, our uh, house has been buzzing mm -hmm. to get the house ready for that because mm -hmm. our daughter stays with us. Awesome. And so, we're just getting you know her room prepared. Mm -hmm. And so... That's been a lot of our energy these days, right. uh, at home at least. Ain't that like being a grandparent? Yes, <laughs> yes. And so, um, me, you know, um, at home, you know, I'm a gamer. <laughs> so to really stress, I play my PS4. Right. And, um, I like to read and, you know, and uh, we like to go to movies together, me and my wife, and I like to eat out and just enjoy life. Mm -hmm. um, right. We thought we have an empty nest at this point. <laughs> of course. That's not going to be happening anytime soon. <laughs> right, you're going to get more to the nest now. <laughs> we're going to get more to the nest. Mm -hmm. The babies That's have right. a baby, so we got to have the babies That's and the babies. Right. And ain't nothing like having all that family there. Isn't that yeah. a phenomenal thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get a certain age, you can raise them and you That's know, right. like, go live your life. That's Fly, right. Be free. That's true. <laughs> so you are the pastor at the Mission House Church yes. here in Salisbury, North Carolina, mm -hmm. um, which is a great place. I've been there many times. You guys right. do some awesome things over there. So tell us just a few of the things that you guys got going on over there. Well, one, uh, we started a church by accident. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we initially started out as sort of an outreach ministry mm -hmm. back in 2011 here in Salisbury. Right. And so we would do work amongst the homeless. Okay. Uh, we would do a lot of community activism and organizing in the community. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we meet in coffee houses, street corners, and stuff like that. And so for us, it was about being the church. Mm-hmm. Um, but what ended up happening is a lot of people who are from here, I'm not from here. Right. My wife's from here, and other people that's connected with us are from here. I'm originally from Birmingham, Alabama. Mm-hmm. But as I get to know the community, people began to ask, so when are y'all going to become a church? Okay. Mm-hmm. And so we, we come from a paradigm like we were being the church. I got you. Right. Mm-hmm. So at the heart of our church has always been about being church and not just having church. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so how do we be the body of Jesus uh, in our community? Yes. And so uh, because of that, because of that work, that community orientation, we really consider ourselves a, a true community-based church. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, that does work with our youth. Uh, Mo's actually a part of one of our programs mm-hmm. right, called, called, right. called Next Generation Productions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do filmmaking. We teach young people filmmaking skills, mm-hmm. leadership skills. Yes, um, and uh, that's one of the things that we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do fire nights, which is mm-hmm. an uh, open mic night, open yes. to the arts in our community. Mm-hmm. It's not a religious event. It's for mm-hmm. the whole entire community, mm-hmm. for wherever you come from. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do a lot of community organizing in our church. Yes. We've held congressional debates. Yes, you do. We've had city council debates. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've done town hall meetings in our church. Mm-hmm. Uh, so our church is really trying to be that ground zero for social justice work in our community. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have uh, after school programs. Uh, we've run summer programming for math and science mm-hmm. or math and reading uh, that my wife runs called Bright Minds. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. And so that's some of the yeah. stuff. I that's can name some other stuff. That's a lot. That, <laughs> is, awesome. Yes. that yeah. is awesome. And that's a part. And the thing is, like, we do that not to outreach. This is mm-hmm. this is truly who we are exactly. as a church. Exactly. So we're not doing it just to get people to come in on Sunday morning. Right. So it's, right. It's not a, carrot and stick kind of thing. This is truly who we are. Right. And, and so. you're not lying because I've been to your church. Yeah. I've been to a lot of the programs that you offer. I've been to those debates. I've been to those forums at your mm-hmm. church. I've been to fire nights. <laughs> and you guys are real over there. You really yeah. are. You're very real for what you bring to the city and to the community as a whole. Yeah. Um, so I read that you're a mystic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that that was interesting because not everybody can define themselves as a mystic. Right. Kind of explain to our viewers what that actually means. Right. So um, I'm one who's rooted in uh, African tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, I come from um, the strand of Christianity that comes from Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I didn't. when I became a Christian, um, I didn't come up in a church where Christianity was white Christianity. So my interest in Christianity was through African Christianity, through blackness, through black liberation. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I didn't have to learn how to like, unlo- I didn't have to learn how to unlearn that God was not white. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. That God was actually black. Right. You know? And so mm-hmm. I didn't have to learn all that. Right. So, um, so a mystic, uh, when you go back to Africa, a part of the way the African worldview, or as they say, philosophers, they say the African cosmology, mm-hmm. which is how uh, Africans understand the world. And, from the Western, Sub-Saharan, Eastern Africa, it's the understanding that the spiritual world is all around us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, uh, and you see this in the New Testament with the Apostle Paul. He says that we live and move and have our being in God. Mm-hmm. So the mystic understands that uh, God is always around us. Mm-hmm. God is not, not present with us ever. God is always mm-hmm. present right. with us. Right. So the mystic understands that their, their practice, their way of living in the world, is to find direct engagement with God, have that direct relationship with God, mm-hmm. which in turn leads them to be an agent for change in the world. Mm. Right. I love it. I love it. So yeah, that's. I was struggle. intrigued by that when I saw the word mystic. I was like, "What does that mean?" Mm-hmm. And so I researched it to find out exactly. But I wanted you to explain yourself mm-hmm. what exactly what it means. We're going to go to commercial, and we'll come right back with more of Pastor Anthony Smith in the Queendom History Week. Hold up! It's that time of the year again. It's our month to shine. Everybody lend your ear again. 28 or 29 days isn't nearly enough time to discuss the accomplishments of the black community, so we can't imagine only having seven. But that was the case in 1926, when author and historian Carter G. Woodson launched the celebration of Negro History Week in the hopes of highlighting the community during a time when their efforts were being ignored. In 1969, the leaders of the Black United Students at Kent State University proposed an extension. And seven years later, or 50 years after the week's inception, the U.S. government made the month official. Honoring black excellence isn't exclusive to the U.S. Both the U.K. and Canada participate, with the U.K. celebrating in October and Canada following suit with the U.S.'s February recognition. No person can imagine where he's going unless he knows where he's been. Number four, black colleges offered opportunities to other discriminated communities. 
Black history has had an impact on, well, everyone. We don't just mean the majority, we mean other minority groups that have had to deal with oppression. Black institutions have a history of opening their doors to other groups who, at the time, didn't have anywhere else to go. A prime example of this being the Jewish community. Historically, these institutions have admitted students of all races, and now almost 40% are other than African American. In the 1930s, Jewish teachers came to the U.S. in hopes of finding jobs after losing their positions in Austria and Germany. Unfortunately, the words of the day were xenophobia and anti-Semitism. But black historical colleges ignored those words and employed over 50 Jewish academics. Not only did this create a safe environment for them to work in, but it allowed black and white individuals to engage in important conversations. They have been driven by the fundamental belief that all of our citizens should have access to a higher education if they so desire. Number three, Allensworth was the first all-black township in California. I am Jefferson Allensworth Lamb. Jefferson for he who framed our fine constitution, Allensworth for he who found a community of free blacks, and Lamb, cause I like to eat lamb chops. <laughs> if you build it, they will come. Especially if it means getting away from racial discrimination. That was the goal for Allen Allensworth a man who was born into slavery and who would later become the first African American to become a lieutenant colonel. After his army days, him and his family moved to California where he began to implement his dream, creating an all-black community where they would be allowed to thrive and be free of discrimination. The town had many great successes, including having California's first African American school district. Even after Colonel Allensworth died in 1914, and when people started leaving to pursue jobs during World War II, the town continued on and is still around today. Its downtown area now stands as the Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park, and there are still residents who live outside of it. Number 2. Claudette Colvin did Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks Despite their impressive history, black women don't always get the recognition they deserve. Of course, there are women we talk about every February, such as Claudette Colvin and her refusal to give up her seat on the bus. But what's that? You believe we're referring to Rosa Parks? Yes, it's true that Miss Parks was the catalyst to the Montgomery bus boycott, but nine months before this historical moment, 15-year-old Claudette was the first to ever be arrested for not giving up her seat as she insisted that it was her constitutional right. And I felt like this is my time to take a stand for justice. She may not have gotten the recognition at the time, but her impact is undeniable. I just wanted people to come together and unify and fight the segregation. Number one, there have been many notable achievements in black geekery. For some reason, people are surprised when black nerds, or blurds, if you prefer, enter the scene. I'm gonna give you the good, the bad, and the nerdy. In reality, they've been here the entire time. In fact, we wouldn't have some of the geekery we hold dear without them. Meet Gerald A. Jerry Lawson, the man responsible for home video game consoles with his Fairchild Channel F, the first system to use interchangeable cartridges. If you're a movie buff, check out Mark Hanna, who developed the 3D graphics technology used in a lot of movies, including a little-known flick about dinosaurs in some park. You even have black geeks to thank for the Super Soaker, invented by Lonnie Johnson. Because really, what's nerdier than running around with epic water guns? This epic black cosplay movement. That's what. We hope we've enlightened you about the significance of black history, because we barely scratched the surface of the accomplishments of the black community. Our school has a fine library, or so I've been told, <laughs> where any student who wants to can study more about black history. Do you agree with our picks? Check out these other great clips from Watch Mojo and subscribe for new videos every day. Uh, we are back in the Queendom Nation. And um, in honor of Black Christmas Month, we will be doing the I Am segment in the Queendom, where we're featuring all the different African-American pioneers in, you know, in that respect. So, we're back. More questions. <laughs> During slavery and the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. the church was a major factor and contributor to the people being able to have a platform where they could organize as a pastor and member of the clergy. Tell us how important this, the role of the church today, when it comes to activism, is that right, activism? Mm -hmm. And organize, I had to make sure I said it right. Said okay. right. Yes, right. Yeah. So there is uh, a rich tradition within, specifically the black church, um, 
of what I call prophetic black religion. Uh, when black folks uh, organize, you see this in not only the civil rights church, but you also see this during like uh, periods in history, like the early 20th century with the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. uh, Harlem Renaissance was a very uh, robust, very explosive period of creativity, activism, political organizing that was in Harlem, New York. A lot of that stuff was done out of the basement of churches, wow. organized yeah, out of the, our little spaces. Wow. Yeah. Um, so the black church in those instances has always been a space for mobilizing creativity, the changing of the imagination. Um, some, one of our great civil rights leaders, people like uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., mm -hmm. of course he was a Baptist minister. Mm -hmm. um, he represented that well. Mm -hmm. um, and so the black church, um, and the thing is, there's, there's different kinds of black church, right? Because not all black churches supported Dr. King. A lot of people don't know that. Right. Um, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. And so you had a lot of black churches that were afraid of King. Mm -hmm. um, so you got different kinds of church. You got plantation black church and you right. got liberation black church. Mm -hmm. And so you got, and that's, and that's just the reality. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you got some black churches that that just, you know, concerned about people's spiritual well-being, um, but won't challenge the status quo, won't stand as challenge the powers and injustice mm -hmm. in the community for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I stand within the black church tradition that's really about how do we mobilize and organize and challenge power right. so that the people in our community can experience flourishing, they can experience mm -hmm. life um, without all the barriers of injustice that get in the way. Mm -hmm. um, so the black church really has uh, the potential, and even here where we live here in North Carolina, um, it has the potential to be a profound and deep well of spiritual energy uh, to just ignite folk, to right. become catalytic, right. mm -hmm. to right. bring about change in that That's community. Right. It's mm -hmm. not even just about political activism. Mm -hmm. It's also about uh, economic right. uh, well-being. It's exactly. about um, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It's about creativity, the arts, and all these different things. Uh, the church is postured, I believe, because we literally have churches yeah. In every neighborhood in yes, this community. Yes, we do. Could you imagine if every church in this community That's became right. an incubator right. for human flourishing? Exactly. Mm -hmm. That they created space for people to enlarge their imagination and their souls, to, right. to be engaged in the political process, to be engaged in the building of capital in their own right. community. Could you imagine that? Boy, boy what would we have? We have a revolution. We yeah. sure would. We yep. sure would. Instead of a black town, we have a whole black city. <laughs> yeah, we to would. A black state. <laughs> right, right. Then a black country. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes, right. sir. But more important, we have a place that our, our children can grow up and live yeah. uh, without harm. And learn who they are yeah. right. as an individual. Yeah. Right. right. Yes. Unfortunately, I just have one more question. All right, let's just, do it. What I, you got for Unfortunately, I got one more. All I wish right. I had... Plenty more. I but, know, but we learned so yes, much. Yes, we are. What you got for We us? are. And, speak, <laughs> and speaking of organ, organ mm, excuse me, and speaking of organizing, <laughs> let's talk about the Poor People's Campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, or also known as the Poor People's March in Washington, mm -hmm. 1968. Mm -hmm. This was an effort to gain economic justice for poor people in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little on the importance of the Poor People's Campaign for 2020 mm -hmm. and um, how it affects us is and how we can and how we can get involved? Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is a continuation of Dr. King's legacy. Before mm -hmm. King had died, King, in the last phase of King's career as an activist and organizer, he was really concerned about uh, poverty mm -hmm. and the ways in which the structures and systems in our in our country actually increase poverty. It increased the vibes between have and have nots. And so um, before King uh, was assassinated, he was planning a mass march on Washington. Mm -hmm. They were literally going to shut down Washington, D.C. until there was things done by Congress like universal health care. Mm -hmm. He was talking about that then. A just and living wage, he was talking about that then. Mm -hmm. He was beginning to talk about environmental concerns. Yeah. Um, he was talking about a whole host of issues. Uh, that we're still dealing with the data, mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in a little day, we're going to create a little tent city all around D.C., shutting down the interstate and all that massive civil disobedience mm -hmm. to shut down the government. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, of course, he was assassinated of course. Yeah. Uh, before you could pull that off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what the, the current Poor People's Campaign that's co chaired by uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, William Barber mm -hmm. and uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Liz Theo Harris. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are two uh, leaders, uh, religious leaders, mm -hmm. who have called various coalitions across the spectrum, mm -hmm. LGBTQIA, right. 
uh, poor folks, um, uh, black folk, Latin, Latinx, uh, climate change uh, activists. And so it's a massive movement that's organized around four things. Mm -hmm. uh, to address ecological devastation, or as we say, climate change. Because mm -hmm. the way that we build our economy now is actually destroying the planet. Right. Mm -hmm. And the way that we consume at a rate, a lot of people don't know this, Americans, the world, we consume at a rate that requires one and a half planets. Mm -hmm. We only live on one planet. Wow, that's right. Two, it addresses systemic racism, the historic mm -hmm. past of white supremacy, institutional racism. Uh, it deals with poverty, systemic poverty, the ways that our country creates greater wealth divide. And then um, nationalism, white nationalism, right. which is tied to uh, racism. But you see this being prominent now with the current administration. Right. Um, they used to talk about the, the thing about nationalism. So what it does, it cuts us off from the rest of the world. Because right. mm -hmm. our economy is tied to other economies exactly. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's actually a moral mass march that's planned out for June. Okay. Um, I have some information about that I can give you. Yeah, you, can, you, can shout, um, you can send that out to your networks. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, plat we're actually organizing here in Salisbury. Okay. We have an organizing team that represents the national movement here awesome. that I'm actually a part of. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to organize folks to go to D.C. with us in June mm -hmm. to be a part of a new mass mobilization. I would love to be uh, a part of that. <laughs> to bring about just so we got a bus, and so we're trying to get seats filled. Yeah. And specifically, the thing that's unique about this movement that I want to say is at the center of this movement mm -hmm. are those who are most impacted. Mm -hmm. So those who have been most impacted by poverty, racism, right. ecological right. devastation, and all that. And so we're putting them in centerpiece as a part of this movement. Mm -hmm. So not just a top-down it's really a bottom-up movement. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. Great. Well, lovely Mo, um, you work very closely with Pastor Smith. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're part of Next Generation. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot of work very closely with Pastor Smith. So this is your chance to, to talk with your pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Have Still a conversation with your pastor and the queen them. All right, Pastor Anthony. Like, that's our road dog. Oh. That's right. <laughs> So you read many books. What is your favorite book? And why is this your favorite book? And what mm. book do you recommend that we read? Wow. Um, my favorite book. Wow. Well, I read across various genres. Mm -hmm. uh, so it depends on what genre you're interested in. Because <laughs> right now I'm reading about, I'm reading a book on quantum physics. And I'm reading a book about, um, I'm reading a fictional thing about the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm reading some other stuff about economics and stuff like that. Um, but I guess if there's one book uh, that I would recommend that I'm reading right now, um, uh, there's a book written by Dr. James called The Haitian Revolution. And uh, C.L.R. James uh, is a Caribbean uh, scholar who wrote about the Haitian Revolution. You know thing about Haiti? Mm -hmm. Haiti was really the only successful uh, armed rebellion right. by African slaves right. against European powers, specifically the French. Exactly. Because because we've had we had about three to four hundred uh, enslaved African rebellions mm -hmm. in the United States that a lot of people don't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, S, I would say SLR James, mm -hmm. uh, The Haitian Revolution. Right. Um, this book has really been speaking to me right mm -hmm. now. All right. Sounds mm -hmm. good. Something I want to get into. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Pastor Anthony, for entering the cleaning today. And if we want to come worship with the Mission House, can, how can we find it and what time does the service, the service start? Right. So uh, Mission House, uh, we are at 120 Statesville Boulevard. Uh, we, if you're familiar with Salisbury, we're right across the street from College Barbecue. Mm -hmm. um, we worship Sundays at 1030 a.m. Mm -hmm. And on second Sunday of the month, we worship at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a morning worship that day. It's a 2 p.m. service. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come worship with the Mission House and Pastor Smith, I'm sure he would love to have you come out and worship with him. Mm -hmm. um, before mm -hmm. we get into our community highlight of the week, we want to thank Pastor Smith for coming on to our set mm -hmm. today because he really dropped some very interesting knowledge. And as far as it's being Black History Month, those are some topics that we really need to mm -hmm. sit down and have a conversation about. Mm -hmm. And so we thank you so much for having that conversation mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. You know, those are issues as as black people that you know we really need to understand mm -hmm. our communities we need to understand where we come from mm -hmm. so that we can know where we're going 
-hmm. And so we thank you for all the information yes. that you dropped in the Queendom. And I hope people that view this show really take into consideration what you told us here today mm -hmm. and what you brought to the Queendom today right. because of what we've been through is the reason why we're able to sit here, mm -hmm. give you a free talk show, able to be entrepreneurs, yes. able to hold churches, able to have these things mm -hmm. because of our ancestors and, and the way that they, you know, how they paved the way for us. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for that. We really mm -hmm. appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah, Mo, what's our community highlight of the week? What we got going on? <laughs> our community highlight of the week pledges to visit for Black History Month. Mm -hmm. The International Civil Rights Center and Museum open Monday through Friday. 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Admissions $15, address 134 South Elm Street, Greensboro, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And the Harvey B. Grant Center for African American Arts and Culture open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. 5 p.m. And Saturday and Sunday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Admission $5 to $9, address 551 South Tryon Street. Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the International Civil Rights Center Museum because Pastor Smith just went oh, wow. and experienced that, and I went and experienced it. And what you see when you first walk In honor of Black History Month and the Queendom, we will be doing an I Am segment. And, and what that means is that we're going to feature and honor different African-American pioneers. And with the respect of that, we're going to start in the early 19th century. I helped many slaves pass through the Underground Railroad. The white slave owners began to notice that the loss of slaves was taking a toll on their income and production. Soon these anti-abolitionists came up with a reverse underground railroad system where they took escaped slaves that were captured and they recaptured them and brought them back to their plantations to sell them to new owners. So I took the courage to fight off anti-abolitionists by throwing hot water on them and I would cut them and I would stab them if they overpowered me. I helped fugitives escape or hide so that they could journey and continue their journey on to freedom. I courageously fought whites and captured, that captured free slaves. I am a former slave and I was fed up with the harsh treatments of being a slave. I settled in Berlin Crossroads, Ohio, also known as Little Africa. I took matters into my own hands to protect, rescue, and help my people, runaway slaves trying to make it to freedom. I am Aunt Polly. Jackson. Welcome back to the Queendom. We're going to give you our social media platform before we go. I am Annette Numi Smith on Facebook. I am DRJ Trinity Business Group. I am Great Women and Men United. I am Team of Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I am what? We are Bridge for Kids. Make sure because mm -hmm. we I do mentor with a Bridge for Kids on Wednesdays under Brooklyn Witherspoon. So if you guys are not busy, please come out, hang out with us. We are Studio 420 Productions on YouTube. Please like and subscribe and ding that little bell so you can get them notifications from us. And we are definitely the Queendom Nation show on Facebook. All episodes will be on there. So, who we got over here? All right, we got Queen C. Mm -hmm. And you can also find me on Facebook as Christy Sloan. You can also find me as Slay by Sloan on Facebook, your favorite hairstylist. You can find me also <laughs> on Instagram as Country Girl 13, and mm -hmm. that's Country with a K. And I can also be found on Snapchat, y'all, at Christy mm -hmm. Sloan 13. Go at me. All right. Mm -hmm. And you got Lovely Mo. You can find me on Facebook as Mahogany Coots. On Instagram as Junie underscore is the love. On Twitter as Junie is the love. Mm -hmm. And on Inst and Snapchat in Coots. Oh one eighteen. All right. I'm also DRJ Trinity Business Group and Great Women United on Instagram and Manette Smith on, um, sorry, on Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys for tuning into the Queendom and our Black History segment. We look forward to you next week. We got some more great things coming in mm -hmm. for Black History Month, ladies. We do. Mm -hmm. Right. Stay so tuned. thanks for entering the Queendom Nation. Give them a Queendom snap, ladies. <laughs>